Hello, everybody, and welcome to Take the Lead's monthly virtual happy hour. We're so glad you're here, and this is a really, really special one. I know I say that every time, don't I? But I, Because I think all of our virtual happy hours are very special. They all happen on the second Wednesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, but you know, it's happy hour somewhere, anytime. So wherever you are, we want you to make yourself comfortable, get your favorite mocktail, cocktail, glass of tea, cup, you know, whatever it is that you like, and sit back and relax, and you're going to have some fantastic speakers today. I'm going to tell you, there are several big firsts that have never happened before for our virtual happy hours, just for you, just for you, because this is a very special day. Anybody know what this is? Of course you do. It's International Women's Day. International Women's Day. And I am so excited on International Women's Day to be a part of an amazing conference with an amazing group called Pink Petro. And I will be talking with the founder of Pink Petro, Katie Manich, and we are going to have a lot to talk about, about vision, about leadership, about found, founding a new, new organization, the, the ups and downs, the trials, the tribulations. And then we're going to also have um, a conversation about, well, some of the issues that women lawyers face uh, when they're working in a male-dominated organization. And finally, we're going to have our first dude. Hang on, it's gonna be great. So our virtual happy hours are, as you know, they're completely free. We're delighted that you're here. Um, with those of you who are here, we'll be able to tweet in or, or, or chat in questions. Um, I always do full disclosure when I have a part of the virtual happy hour that is not live. And because Katie is going to be so completely busy with her conference, she has graciously agreed to do some preliminary uh, conversation with me so that we have this available to you. And then the second half of our program will in fact be live. So you will still be able to chat in or tweet in your questions. And you can tweet them in for Katie too. And I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them after the fact, or you know how I am, I'll make up the answer and I'll tell you what it is, right? Okay, all right. So you all know that Take the Lead's mission is to prepare, develop, inspire, and propel women to take their fair and equal share of leadership positions across every sector by 2025. And we're extremely delighted to be able to partner with Pink Petro to provide some of our training services collaboratively to women in the energy industry. Now, as somebody who spent a great deal of my life in the West Texas oil patch, I can tell you that this is a particular um, thrill for me. And before I introduce Katie, I just want to make sure that both you and Katie have noticed, I usually am wearing red, but I am in my pink Petro pink today. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> so I'm all in, I'm all in for you. So Katie, Katie, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, all of our followers and friends at Take the Lead. And, um, and, and, and I would like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your own story. You co-founded, or you founded, all on your own, you founded Pink Petro. And I'm sure you had some reasons for wanting to do that. And we want to know all about what brought you to that place. How did you get to be you? Where did you grow up? What was your background that led you to want to start Pink Petro? Well, that's a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. Where did I come from? Well, I came from a little little town called uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. So not exactly. I've heard of that. <laughs> kind of a, a very well-known town, as, yeah. as, you, uh, as everyone knows. But uh, so I'm born and raised in a Cajun family in the deep south and uh, my father was an oil and gas engineer in the 80s and I watched him lose his job. So interestingly enough, uh, very young on, I was told, don't get into this business, don't get into oil and gas, don't get into energy, there's no future in energy. Um, it was really, you know, it was really um, interesting as a child kind of growing up, you know, you're always looking for purpose and what do I want to be when I grow up? And, um, I always, I, I idolized my father and my mother, but you know, my, I'm a daddy's girl. 
And, uh, I, you know, I wanted to be an engineer, but I actually didn't end up becoming an engineer. I, I went and worked um, early in my career, got into uh, consulting, and then noticed that I really liked problem solving and I liked people. And so I got the opportunity to come down to Houston. Uh, at the time, I was, I was living in St. Louis, and I got the opportunity to, to come to Houston and uh, work for Enron. So that was my foray into the energy industry. It was working for good old Enron at 22 years old when, uh, um, you know, I didn't have a lick of experience, but uh, had, a, had the opportunity to be kind of a part of a big, um, a pivotal time, not just in the energy industry, but really in the world, because Enron really kind of shocked, you know, the business world, the financial markets and whatnot. So did that and then landed at Shell at some point in my career, Shell and then BP, and um, found myself uh, working for extremely smart people, extremely smart women, uh, women engineers. Um, I was very, I was always full, uh, I was always in a room of just amazing, amazingly smart people, always in a room with people who were way smarter than me, and I, I like it that way. And uh, I had an engineer once kind of turn to me and she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I thought, you know, my industry doesn't do a good job at educating what you can be. You know, you're an engineer or you're an engineer. And while we need engineers, we also need so many other kinds of people. So she took a chance on me and she said, you know, I got this thing over here, this safety project I want you to, to take on. And I thought, safety? I'm like, that's incredibly technical. That's very much something I would expect like my father, you know, to have been more mechanically inclined. And she said, no, 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 I just want to give you, you know, this, this little safety assignment. So it was a road safety assignment, helping people stay safe on the roads. Because as you can imagine, in our industry, you know, we're moving people, equipment, fuel, right? Big, big tankers. So uh, I took a shot at it, loved it, and uh, was in health and safety for most of my career at, at Shell and then at BP after, after, the, after the oil spill. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But what I found was I was surrounded by men. And I know this is a common story, right? You talk to women all the time and they work in these male dominated industries. Um, but oil and gas is as oil and gas and oil and gas is as male as it's going to get. Yes, indeed. Yes. So I found myself being that woman that people would call and say, I'm trying to, you know, find a resource. I'm trying to find someone, you know, I'm trying to find help. So I came, kind of became um, a, a super connector, I guess. And then at some point, you know, I was on an airplane back in my BP days, sitting next to a gentleman who asked me, you know, why are you in this business? Why aren't you at home with your kids? And, you know, I just thought, gosh, like we're living in, you know, it was 2013, I think about that time, you know, and I thought to myself, that's a strange question to be asking a woman, especially in, you know, this day and age where women and men are both working and they're both working significant roles, right? My husband and I both were working very significant uh, global roles. Right. So at any rate, I don't know. We had a cocktail. He then started talking to me about, you know, why do women want to work? And, oh, I mean, it was just like the, that awful conversation you're having, like, could I be seated next to someone else? And I, couldn't. <laughs> I just kept having, you know, alcohol and we were having a casual conversation. And I started sketching ideas on, on a napkin. And I told the media the story when we first launched, but I thought, like, what if you could take all the women in energy that are out there and bring them in this really great, cool online community? and connect them to help them get resources they need, right? Connect them to awesome resources like Take the Lead, connect them to resources to help them develop in their careers, and, um, you know, use technology to do that. Boy, wouldn't we solve the problem of, you know, the gender gap? Would we solve the problem of this, that? So I just kind of conceived this after a few cocktails. It truly was happy hour. I mean, it was happy hour, you know? It was happy hour, so that's, that's perfect. Well, you know, as I'm listening to you, there are several things points of your story that that really struck me that really resonated with me and one is that you had in effect a mentor who saw more in you than you saw in yourself absolutely and she asked you to take on projects that you would not have raised your hand and said I want to take this on so that's a number one that's really really important and I think that's a role we can all play for other women but number two you said yes this you is said true. yes. You said yes. And it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't been willing to say yes. And then the third thing is your interchange with this man and alcohol or no, 
you had what I call a power to moment. I call that a power to moment. And it is one of those moments when we, when we go, wait a minute, there is something I can do. There is a problem in this world that needs to be solved. And there is something I personally have the ability and the power to do to fix it. So tell us about Pink Petro. What's Pink Petro's mission? Well, so our mission is to unite, connect, develop, and grow women in the industry. Um, sounds very simple, but there's, a, there's a, another motivation there, and that is help the public, help people who are not in this sector really understand what we do and why it's important. Because you and I are having this conversation because of energy. Whether it's fossil fuel energy or green energy, it doesn't matter. We're having that conversation. And my industry um, is very politically charged. So most of the conversations you hear about are environmental or other uh, political, um, you know, that come out of Washington or the Middle East. When really at the end of the day, the people that work in this business, the women and the men, they're making these kinds of conversations happen. They're, make, they're putting the lights on. They're, they're powering mankind. And that's a big, and I say man and woman kind. Good. That's good. Um, like that. Yes. <laughs> how cool is it to be able to say, that's what I get up every day and do. Um, and uh, so, so I have a motivation on both sides, which is really to connect and bring women together but then let's build diverse teams so that we can go out, educate other people to be a part of the industry and solve some of the biggest challenges we have out there, like climate change, you know, like, uh, like uh, cleaner burning energy. I think people assume that people in the energy industry don't care about the planet, and that's just absolutely false. So it's a twofold. It's an educational piece, you know, for people on the outside to get them to want to be interested in being in the industry. And it's, hey, let's get all the really smart women together, right? And let's connect them so that we can help each other in our careers. Well, one thing I know about, about the energy industry from, from the, 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 the uh, close uh, view that I've had of it is that there, it is an industry in which there are ups and downs. There are constantly ups and downs. There seems to never be stasis. It's always either up or down. What phase are we in now and what opportunities does that present? For women. So uh, when we launched, I say we were in the carpe the chaos uh, phase. <laughs> That's power tool number five, in case anybody power is not familiar five. with the nine leadership power tools. Yes. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> because because what I, I know what I saw when I launched was, wow, we spent all this time trying to get more women into STEM, get more women into the industry, and we're going to let a downturn push, you know, all that progress aside. I mean, let's be honest. Women and minorities are impacted by these kinds of crises. It's, it's well studied. It's well published. I don't need to go do a study to tell you that we lost a ton of women. Like last and hired, I, first fired kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And two years ago, I, I saw that and I said, I've got to get this out there as the crisis is happening so that we keep women in the game. Now, for me, I felt like this was actually an opportunity for women to own it, to take their moment. We're living in very visible, uh, uh, very volatile times, as you know. I mean, everything is tweeted. Everything is, you know, um, everything is, is out there. There's constant prolifer proliferation of, in uh, of information. And my industry doesn't actually uh, typically choose to engage in very public discussions. Well, that's changing. That's changing because um, we need to educate people. And I think women actually bring a different perspective to the story. Um, and that's why I've told women, I've said, you know what, it's time to use our voices. It's time to say, look, we're mothers. We care about our planet too, right? This is what we do and I'm proud and I'm not going to be, um, I'm, I'm not going to apologize, right, for the work that I do. Um, give women the chance to really kind of step up and own, you know, own the stage, you know, be proud of what you do. And so um, the past two years, that's what it's been about, is giving women that voice and giving them a place to, to practice that voice. As you know, you know, we like to practice, like we like to, you know, be in the mirror, right? practice before we take, you know, take things uh, forward. Whereas our male counterparts are like, you know, they'll just go out and, you know, wing it, right? And, and it's no big deal. So we've tried really hard to create a safe place where people can connect, find their voice, and tell their stories because their stories matter. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, and and when, you, when we talk about the Her World program, maybe you'd like to take just a couple of, of moments and we'll share some of the photos and some of the experiences that we have at Her World. And I'm, I can't wait to get there next week and, and to do it. But um, just share with us a few of the highlights that yeah. The women, well, are, the women and men who are at Her World are going yeah. to have an opportunity to see. Well, this has been a great event. We, we threw this together last year, literally in a 90-day period, on a cocktail napkin as well. So there's a theme there. Uh, cocktail napkins seem to be the best places to design um, business ideas and events and things like that. But um, uh, Her World represents an opportunity to bring women together to connect on the issues. So the energy, the, the business side of the energy uh, coin, um, development, which is the area you're in, obviously, policy, which is that kind of, you know, political side, you know, where are we headed in terms of uh, energy policy, and, uh, and workforce, the workforce at large, what are some things that, that we can see, uh, you know, happening and shaping and, and changing, and, and then the other element is technology, so we really look at a couple of different areas of focus at the event, uh, today, because actually it's not today, it's in a week, but I'll say today because it would have happened already. <laughs> um, you know, what we would have done and what we're going to do actually is, is, um, is bring people together to talk about those topics. And I'm so excited that we have our, um, have our partnership where we're going to be working with Take the Lead Women to bring your program to women in the energy industry. Um, what I found about access to development in my industry is, is you know, you're either, uh, you're either selected in a large company to receive, you know, um, some really great training, um, and then, or you're not. And what I found is, is that um, access to development is not always equal. And so what we're trying to do is, is really level that playing field and bring some external perspective into the industry um, because I think there's, there, there are great tools out there to be able to, you know, to bring to bear to, to, to women in energy. So today is about doing that. Today is about announcing that partnership. Today is about um, starting that uh, journey and getting women access to the education and the, the needed resources they, they need in order to get at the gender gap. Because as you know, you talk about gender parity. I think the World Economic Forum has us at, I don't know, like 90 years maybe in the energy sector. So we're hoping to reduce that. And it's through partnerships like Take the uh, take Lead um, that we want to accomplish that. Absolutely, absolutely. And we are thrilled, honored, and, and delighted to be part of that. And, and um, it, just to say more about the, the training that we're going to be doing together, it will be an, an online but very interactive, very personalized course, a certificate course that people will get a certificate at the end of it. It'll be, I think we've got it six or seven weeks long. So there's plenty of time to kind of get into the material. And it's about, you know, it's not going to be about like technical things because yes. you can learn that. You can learn the technical parts of the industry in a lot of different places. But what do you know about yourself as a leader? How, what is it that you want to do with your life, with your one wild and precious life, as the, the poet Mary Oliver says? Um, how do you get there? How do you create those intentions for yourself? How do you create a strategic leadership action plan for yourself? so that you have a means to get where you want to go in a way that adds value to your company and to the work that you do. So we are just just really excited and uh, and, and, and we, we, we are it's, it's, it's really it all comes together in this one her world moment. So um, so I think we're going to go forward together and do lots of amazing things. Absolutely. So Katie, Katie, if you uh, one of the things we always ask our guests to do, uh -huh. is to give people a takeaway, you know, some piece of advice or some, something that, some reference, some resource or something that has really helped you and might help them. What advice would you give to the women? And there will be some men too who will be watching, but what advice would you give? My biggest piece of advice to anyone who asks is be yourself. Uh, you can't Photoshop personality. Uh, you got to be you and so you've got to embrace who you are and own it. Uh, I still struggle with this on occasion um, as I'm growing and developing in my own, you know, in my own journey. Uh, I think sometimes we, we think we need to be scripted and her rehearsed and perfect. And 
polished and the fact of the matter is, is the world and life is very messy and it is okay to just be you. So I tell people that all the, all the time. That's like my signature line, which is you just cannot Photoshop personality. You've just got to embrace and, and be who you are because it's people see through it. You know, people absolutely see through it. So that's the one takeaway I would give. That is a, that is a great line. We, we should make bumper stickers and t-shirts. <laughs> bumper stickers. <laughs> it's and really good. <laughs> posts. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'm all into t-shirts too, you know. It's, it's always, always good to have those things on t-shirts. Yeah. So um, when you look at, say, three to five years out, what will Pink Petro have accomplished by then, what's your vision for Pink Petro to do in the next three to five years? Well, I tend to take a very, a much longer view than most. My vision is, you know, we're, we're facing, a, I think, a crisis on a number of levels, at a macro level around skills and um, in every industry out there. Um, we just have a lot of uh, societal forces coming together, you know, generational changes going on, economic changes is go changes going on. But I'd love in five years, even 10 years, for people to say, wow, I got interested in an industry I didn't think that I would ever think was a good place to work. So we want to be that place that attracts new, uh, new thinking, uh, diverse candidates, people from outside the industry, right, to to want to be a part of solving our global energy challenge. That's, if you think about that, that's just pretty, um, it's a big problem, right? I mean, we're, we're using more of it every, you know, every day. And we've got to do that in a responsible way. And I want Pink Petra to be that community known for attracting new blood, new talent, new ideas, and harnessing the power of women, um, as a part of, of, of serving that global uh, need. So that's, that's, I know that's very aspirational. Um, yes, and it should I, be. Yeah, it should be. I'd like to be out of a job. <laughs> you know, like you and I should be sitting on a beach somewhere saying, wow, we solved that gender gap problem. Woohoo! You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be working, you know, on this problem. My daughter's six. It's, it's so time. Like my mom's, you know, 75 going, when are we going to solve this problem? You know, and I'm like, it needs to be in my lifetime. And I, exactly. so I really want to be, I'd love to retire knowing that, that we did it, that we did something and we made um, a difference. So well, I, I promise you, I promise you, we will have that virtual happy hour on a beach. It right. will be a real happy hour, a real happy hour on a beach. <laughs> we won't be talking about solving the gap. Right. right. We will have solved the gender the gap. gap. We <laughs> The pay gap will be gone. We will have right. done all of those things. Right. Uh, yeah. So how then, if people want to find out more about Pink Petro, how can they find you? Tell people how they can find you and what you want them to do. It's pink, uh, www.pinkpetro.com. And today on International Women's Day, we just launched our global careers platform for women in energy and that's just experience.energy so if you go Ooh. to experience.energy you'll get to our career site and you can fill out a profile you know get engaged and hopefully get that next job fantastic katie this has been just wonderful talking with you and um is there anything else that you'd like to say I just want to say thank you, Gloria. We're going to have so much fun together. I am so excited. Um, I, I think it's wonderful. The internet brought us together and so many other uh, things. And I'm really excited about bringing Take the Lead Women to women in my industry. Fantastic. Me too. Can't wait to get started. See you very soon. Give a big cheer for Katie. Oh, I'm so right. proud of her. Okay. Right. Katie rocks. Fantastic. Well, we have all been having a wonderful day today at Her World 17, and I'm really thrilled to, uh, to continue this virtual happy hour with two of the amazing people who I've met here. And uh, so in the, in the spirit of Sister Courage, hashtag Sister Courage, which as you know is one of our favorites at Take the Lead, we are welcoming you here for International Women's Day and to continue talking about some of the things we've been talking about here at Her World. So welcome back to Take the Lead's monthly virtual happy hour. 
I have two really fabulous guests here this evening who you're going to get a chance to meet and talk to. Don't forget to send your questions in and remember to stay to the end when we will announce the winner of our, our monthly giveaway, which is, drum roll please, an hour of consultation or counseling or coaching or, you know, just shooting the breeze, whatever you want with me. And I really look forward to that and get to, uh, get to be with people every single month who are supporters and friends of Take the Lead, and it's, it's really a great experience. So, all right, don't forget, don't forget, stay with us, stay with us. All right, so now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to two folks, one of whom works every day, I suspect, with, uh, <laughs> with Pink Petro. I do, yes, I do. <laughs> very wonderful, Marianne Roback. And she is, I, I have to read this to, to give you the proper um, to do credibility, you right? You know, because I'll never get the name of your firm right if I don't read it. Okay. Corporate and business litigation attorney at, ooh, we, Carson She Sersonsky Rosa Garcia. I, should, I knew I should have missed that. <laughs> <laughs> just tell the name of your firm. Right. Would you just please tell the name of your firm? And, um, and she is on the board of Pink Petro and also has a fabulous sounding organization, which I hope you will tell us about, Absolutely. Uh, which um, is called the Executive, Executive Mom Society. Mom Society. Right. All right. Very, very cool. And in addition, we have our very first ever dude. Our first dude. I told her I wanted to say that on the screen. <laughs> That's right. First, first dude ever. First dude ever on a Take the Lead virtual happy hour, Josh Lebs. Uh, Josh has written a wonderful book called All In. Uh, he is a, a, a journalist. Still, I guess once a journalist, always a journalist. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, for okay. me, it's true. All right. Okay. So once a journalist, always a journalist. But formerly with PBS and, and or excuse me, NPR and CNN. And so you may have seen him or heard him in those roles, but he's got a passion now that he will tell you about that is really propelling his life in a very visionary way that is going to affect every family in the country and perhaps beyond. So Josh and Marianne, welcome. Thank you so and much for having so us. so glad to have you here. And you know what? It's been an amazing day in her world. And, and what better way to end it than with a virtual happy hour, right? No kidding. <laughs> yeah. You know, if only we had our real happy hour here. But you know, we'll... I got my iced tea. You got your iced tea. Okay, well, we'll continue it. All right. So, Josh, why don't we start with... Uh, the, the question I'd really like to ask you to, to tell people is, how did you get to be you? How did you get to be doing what you're doing? And... and uh, you know, let people know how you got here. Sure. So um, well, I was a reporter, as you said, at NPR and CNN, and I was really into fact-checking. And uh, I was fact-checking politicians, presidents, that kind of thing. And then I became a dad at the same time. And when I started reporting on fatherhood, um, the, uh, we got these amazing responses. And I started reporting what's really going on with dads in this country. Uh, I was forced to discover that no one knew this. You know, people believe stereotypes. When I reported that the average working father spends three hours every workday with his kids and that virtually all dads who live with their kids care for them in every major category every day, these things shock people. And I came to understand that what really goes on with dads um, has been in the shadows. And then I had a legal battle to care for my own daughter. I couldn't get fair parental leave at CNN. I took legal action. It got a lot of attention, front page of the New York Times, all this stuff. And I ended up writing a book. So what I did in my book and all in is I looked at this part that no one ever talks about of what's going on with women's leadership in, in uh, the professional sphere. <laughs> One of the biggest reasons women are not able to work their way up the ranks is that men aren't given equal opportunities to be caregivers at home. Now, today's dads want that. So this is what I, what I work on. Now. So I, I think that's very interesting, that, that, uh, that sort of twist mm -hmm. on it which you know, the, the blame, as it were, mm -hmm. is usually placed on women for not staying in the workplace. So and it's sexist. usually assumed that it's because of having children. And we know that there's a great lack of, of uh, systemic support for families in general. Is that why you started your executive moms group? And why don't you tell us how you got to be where you are, Mary sure, and what sure. your passion is? Well, I mean, I'm a litigation attorney. I I went straight to law school after college and went right out there and got in the workforce and was pretty naive about gender roles in the courtroom or in any sort of legal setting. And I quickly caught up to, oh, okay, this is, there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely a gap here. Right. And um, 
I, I found that it was very fulfilling for me to try to fill that gap and try to, and now advise younger lawyers, younger women in corporate America, um, how to juggle it all. You don't have to do it all to juggle it all and how to make it all work if they want it to work. And, um, I'll never forget. I was having a cocktail with my husband. I think it was January of 2013. And I don't know why I know the date, but, <laughs> but we were having a cocktail and I just said, you know what? The problem is that women, well, there's a lot of problems, but one of them is that women don't have the same opportunities to network that men do. Meaning the typical network ne networking events are sporting events mm -hmm. or golfing yep. and, and things that, you know, Golf. either women don't mm -hmm. aren't interested in doing or don't know enough about to feel comfortable accepting an invitation to network in that type of environment. Or in, in some and cases, they're, they're not even invited. They're never invited. Like, because like the guys right, come to yes. this. Well, and furthermore, they're... I think that they're not invited to do that type of networking because men assume that they don't want to, they, right. they don't have the time for it. They, oh, they need to go home, yeah. you know? And, and so what we decided to do at executive mom society, um, Suzette Tejeda, Lisa Pittman, both founded it. I joined shortly thereafter was to create the type of networking that women want to do. So we don't go to sporting events and so we, we could, but, but we traditionally, you know, we'll go to, um, get our hair done or we'll go to, you know, Bailey Banks and Biddle once did a, they closed down their entire jewelry store. We had a cocktail party in there and got to try on, you know, all the jewelry and, and, you know, we've done fashion shows. We raise a lot of money for dress for success. So we, we have a charitable side to it as well, but we have a lot of predominantly power lunches during the week because, you know, we do want to be home at night as, as do fathers. Um, so maybe the networking after work doesn't quite work for us. So we have, we have, power lunches once a month where we have speakers on topics regarding, you know, work to life balance networking or just interesting things about fashion or interior design um, to children's issues. To women helping women. women yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's always a topic that we find interesting and, and we get together and there's always a networking component as well. So essentially long story short, it's to, you know, create, a, create our group to create a network for us. Um, to to rely on each other and refer business to each other as mm -hmm. the case may be. And okay, I want to I want to stop there because yeah. that was what that is the question that was on my mind. Um, one of the things that I I actually have a specific exercise that I do with women in training mm -hmm. because what I notice about women in networking is that we network for friendships first right. or for relationships, whereas men are more likely to network more transactionally mm -hmm. um, and be sure. more open and transparent about how can I help you with your business or how can I help you with your work or how can I help you with whatever no you need. No shame about so it. So I, I just want to, I want to just, I, I want to kind of push on that a little bit sure. and see where your observations are. Well, is this changing? I, I, I literally teach women how to make an ask as well as how to make an offer. Well, one thing networking. that, one thing I definitely advise anytime this topic comes up, which it, it does a lot, um, is women's first question in a networking environment is how are the kids <laughs> and, or, or, you know, how's your wife or they talk about vacations or hmm. things and it's just instinctive instinctively that's what they ask men's first question they ask in networking is somewhere along the lines of how's business because hmm. that's and, what we're there to do we're right, there to talk right, business. right 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 and no, so yeah. yeah so we've actually do they say i like your pink tie <laughs> actually we do comment on each other's right? <laughs> we do and i have a thing for pocket squares so when a guy has a great pocket square i say also pocket that's square that's yeah a lot of that shame yeah. is going away too with the next generation okay. you know we're not so worried people are going to hear that yeah because the, you know i was observing so many women today we, we we would we would connect with each other by saying oh you're wearing pink or oh yeah. you're wearing red for international women's right. day and, uh, and and Josh has his pink tie on. So. But you know what? The women like a good compliment, mm -hmm. and and they they do mm -hmm. like that flattery. You know, even if you are in a professional networking environment, and you you don't want to lose the part of being a woman that right. connects us, and that that is being more social and talking about family, which is what's so great about Executive Mom Society and everything Josh is mm -hmm. doing, is it's letting people in corporate America talk about their families with without families. feeling like you have to. Right. shy away from it and and or that's not appropriate for you're not going to sound professional if you right. bring up your children or anything like that so. absolutely and josh today you talked a lot about how men are afraid mm -hmm. to bring their whole selves basically oh yeah into the workplace yeah. would you share 
some of that. Oh, sure, absolutely. You know, once I took legal action on my case, so many men came out of the woodwork. So talk about your case real quickly, because I'm not sure everybody sure. knows. Sure, oh, what absolutely. No, no, you're right. So okay. um, I faced this ridiculous situation at CNN, which is actually very typical. And it, it was that anyone could get 10 paid weeks to care for their new child, except the biological father. Anyone, <laughs> anyone. I could put out my own kid for adoption, and then someone else could adopt. Some people were suggesting, like, is there a legal way that I can adopt my own kid? Because then I could get... <laughs> It's just all these policies are designed to push women to be the ones to stay home and push men to stay at work. And so I had asked totally in secret, could I have the caregiving leave that's available to literally everyone except biological fathers? And even when my daughter was born prematurely and my wife was very sick, they still said no. So I took legal action. But, um, you know, the way that it relates to this is that when I took this case public and I spoke about what I was doing, all these guys started calling me and telling me their stories and they were crying to me on the phone and so were their wives and telling me that they had been through the same thing and so i came to understand that men have been struggling with this in the shadows today's fathers we were raised by really in a, and largely in a generation of feminism i mean most of the men who are fathers today were raised believing that women would have careers and that they'd be able to, to be equals at home. And now they're finding that that's not the case, that they're being pushed to stay at work. And so they're really struggling with this. And as you're talking about, they are terrified to talk about it for two major reasons. One, they're really afraid that if they talk about their challenges, that they'll unintentionally offend someone. That, you know, that a woman will say, who are you to talk about work-life balance? You're a man in a patriarchy. And I always say it's the exact opposite. Talk about it. We have to talk about it. Um, and, and the other reason that, that they're afraid to talk about it is this idea of manliness, that men aren't supposed to struggle. Men aren't supposed to have these problems. Men are supposed to completely have it together all the time. And the more that we give into that, it's like giving into a bully. We just make things worse. So we all, moms and dads, we all have to talk about this together openly. And how do we get to that point? Maybe both of you could answer that. Yeah, sure, take it first. Yes. You're, you're in very different disciplines. And right. uh, yeah. yeah, with very different sets of issues and problems. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah, I'd love to hear from each of you about how you sure. think you can make that happen. I mean, have, you know, as Cheryl Sandberg says, have your lean-in networks and, and start these conversations and, and have conversations about your children. And if you see, for in, in my role, like as a female, if I see a, a male associate at my law firm and his wife's about to have a baby, I take the initiative to say, what can we do to make this easier on you? Oh, thank you. You know, and... and you are a rare breed. Wow. And wow. That's, I mean, just stop and say that again. I mean, that, seriously, you that say that is, to a man. I have never heard so anybody true. say that Me neither. Me neither. Yeah, yeah. Say yeah. That I mean, just, just uh, in my role, I, I'm a senior associate. I've, I've had the kids. I've, you know, I've, I've dealt with that struggle of, you know, how to still be, you know, active at, you know, my law firm or in my career. And, and so, yes, ask, ask a man who's about to have a child or who has a young baby at home that's not sleeping through the night. Mm -hmm. What can we do to make this easier on you? Just mm -hmm. like we're expecting corporate America to do for women right. is, is to, to, to make accommodations for, for this brief period of time in a parent's life when mm -hmm. you have a young child or mm -hmm. you have a pregnant wife or you are yourself pregnant. Because you know what that does? Not only does it create gender parity mm -hmm. and it opens up the conversation um, within the workplace, um, and, and it levels the playing field, but it also just as a, as a business strategy builds loyalty. If, if I feel, especially, and I don't know how men are because men have been, as you say, closed lipped about it. But for women, I feel like when we're at work or we're doing anything, we need to feel an emotional connection or, or, a, you know, a connection to what we're sure. doing beyond just mm -hmm. the task of what we're doing. And if I'm working for a company that cares enough about me you know, to give me the benefits and accommodate the things that I need, then I'm going to work there. I'm going to stay there longer. It I'm not going to leave. Right? It is the same for men, but we're silent about it. Mm -hmm. But it's the exact same thing for men. You know, and by the way, law firms are some of the worst. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of legal groups, especially with, with women's events at legal organizations. Law firms, I have lawyers in my book. Lawyer, law, it's amazing. Law firms even do illegal things. <laughs> it's so <laughs> obvious, you know, some of these this discriminatory no, policies. No, they don't, Josh. No, never, never <laughs> happened. I'm not saying yours. It's never happened in history ever. Um, so so um, what we have, you know, it's, it's really, it's in all sectors. And and you are rare breed in talking to men that way. Um, but note what you said, that you go to them. They're not going to you. It's, it's in this way of thinking that prevents um, us from moving forward. And yes, because men... 
um, want this very much, but don't talk about it. What they end up doing is they leave their jobs. And so this is part of what I showed in my keynote today that uh, the research found that men now are willing to take pay cuts, switch jobs, move even more often than women in the United States mm -hmm. in order to have more time with their families. But they never talk about it. So the businesses just think they got a new job somewhere, whereas really they would have stayed if they had more support as fathers. And so it's now proven, all the numbers prove it, just like you're saying, when you make sure to support someone, and it's not just a parent, someone who's caring for a sick spouse or an elderly parent, any caregiver, when you as an employer show genuine concern and willingness to be flexible to help make that work, they not only do they stay longer, but they're better brand ambassadors. They go out in the world and they say how great your company is and that you can't even put a price on. That, that's so incredibly true. And, and even, I mean, the way it even affects the bottom line is something that I think is important to quantify mm -hmm. at some point too, because what that means is you have less turnover. If you're the person who's doing the, or the company that's doing the hiring, you have less turnover, you have less costs to retrain people or to train new people. And you have the, the, um, the advantage of having people in the company that actually know the work that are that are consistent and can and make it more sustainable so there are lots of good reasons for doing it um, we, you know our our organizations as we know them were designed by men for mm -hmm. men who had women at home doing the housework and taking care of the kids and men who were told that that's how it's supposed to be and and it was very hierarchical and our culture today is much less accepting of that mm -hmm. I have a question. There's a question that has come in from, from a viewer who's with us. Uh, this is from Allison in Pennsylvania. What can I do in my own area to advance gender parity, especially as a speaker and trainer, focusing on personal and professional mm -hmm. development? So she's somebody who's working with people on their professional development. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give her, Marianne? Create your own network. Get it. Get the conversation going. Um, you know, I I run Executive Mom Society here in Houston, and unfortunately, we are just in Houston right now. Um, but there is gonna there are, maybe you'll be in, in Philadelphia. Yeah, do right, right. Look me up on LinkedIn. Maybe, this right. may be yeah. a connection. Yeah, we I mean, doing our networking. Absolutely, right now. And, and you know, and we and we get requests from all over the country. You know. Is there, a, is there an executive mom society in Dallas or in wherever? And, and I say, no, but you can start one and we'll, work, we'll walk you through it. It's a great organization. But what it does is it opens up the conversation and it, you, you get to network, you get professional development, you get education by way of speakers and sponsors. Um, you, you know, and, and have, if, if it's not executive mom society, then find a group because they, they are or everywhere. Start one. Or start, start one. one. I mean, start Elevate, one. Elevate yeah, is another one. great group. I mean, it's... Um, but but if you're if you're a working mom for sure, you know find a group that's not a playdate group and it's not like a support group for no, working moms. It is a professional development sure. group, and that's you know for for me, that's that's what I would advise is to you know get out there and start your own network. Start it. Start and just in general, if what you're looking to do is is be a speaker and to to mm -hmm. like do consulting, make sure that what you're doing is uh, unique. You gotta have a unique voice. You gotta have a unique point. You know, I do this kind of training with speakers, and and part of what I do is over something called GenieCast, which is where we do it over uh, the computer. And I always start off trying to get people to tell me what's completely unique about what they're there to offer. And if you can't answer that question, then you're not ready. Mm -hmm. But when you have the answer to that question, you've done your research and you know what it is that you're ready to do that's unique, that is the message that will carry you through to your network, through to attracting the support you need and letting it take off. I have a suspicion that part of what's behind this question is I'm working with many women or I'm working with many men and women in these companies. How can I help them? What, how would you, so, so for a person who is counseling and advising and coaching people in, in other companies, um, how, how might you suggest sure. that she could build that into her practice? Oh, I see. So, um, you know, re you mean reaching out and building these kinds of alliances and building and, and giving them the tools that they need? Perhaps. But, yeah. 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 I mean, I think a lot of what it takes is, um, a pragmatic understanding of how companies work. And so a lot of the time, one of the problems is that people come in with these one size fits all solutions and they think it's actually gonna to apply to every company and it really doesn't. You need to go into any of these groups with a lot of knowledge and a lot of information, but a real commitment to brainstorming too and letting them help you see how everything you know, everything that's been proven to work can be shaped to fit that unique group of people, that corporate culture. And I think if you follow that kind of structure, you'll, you'll get pretty far. And if you're in Philadelphia, check out the Third Path Institute. They're awesome. They do great work in this space.
say, say what is that again? Third path. Third path. Third path. What is it? Third path. They do great work in helping um, women and men now um, who want to find work life balance. Mm -hmm. They help them find the right jobs. They help them find within their companies how to build that kind of balance. Okay. So you have just been using a term that kind of annoys me. Mm. You um, want integration. Work life balance. Mm. I, I, I don't know. Is there such thing? I mean, seriously, <laughs> is there such thing? There, there's, What's your experience? There's, there's, there's such thing as outsourcing, delegating, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and, and, and I mean, you know, I've, I'm very fortunate to have a husband who is completely supportive of my career, and, and you know, he's home with the kids watching right now. Hey, honey. Uh, but, but, you know, make sure you use what you've got, you know. Oh, that's my power tool number three. All that's right. What you got. You got <laughs> Maybe that's what I got. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, use your village. And, you know, it, nowadays people don't have quite the village they did 50 years ago or even more because everybody lives all over the country. So you don't have grandma down the street or your aunt down the road that can help out with the kids or that can help out with, you know, whatever, whatever else you've got going on to, so that you can focus on your your career, whatever it is you've got going that day. But you know, villages don't have to be families anymore. You know, just two days ago, my husband was trying to pick up my son because our, our nanny was, was sick that day and he was not going to get to the bus on time. So, you know, we call the neighbor, can you get Joe from the bus? That's your village. Mm -hmm. And you know, professional groups can also be your village to, to help you out and to come up with different resources. But, but absolutely like work to life balance. I don't think it exists. I mean, you know, for me, it's like, if I want to have full attention and I, I think you said it today, like be present with my, or maybe you did be present with my family right. on the weekends. You know, I have help around the house. I have, I have help with, you know, yard work and, 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 and that's what you have to do to make it all work so that you can be present and you're not thinking about a thousand other things. Now I realize there's a lot of working moms and dads that can't, afford to outsource sure um but so then my and i certainly they don't have village, but your village idea it, that applies to everybody absolutely, absolutely. To I, I mean yeah and, and and you don't have to be perfect and you know oh, there's that and and yes. oprah winfrey oprah winfrey said it best <laughs> women can do it all but maybe just not all at once right. you know right. it's like you don't have right. to be perfect you don't yeah. have to be on the pta and pinterest mom <laughs> and throwing the perfect birthday parties and having your children dressed in the perfect outfits right. every morning i mean my daughter goes to school with a bun on top of her head often because I don't have time to, you know, do her hair. Right. Yeah. That's, well, I don't that's really know much right. about hair yet. My daughter's only three. You'll learn. You'll, 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 learn. Learn. you'll totally learn. Yes, yes. I, 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 I should have a friend. I know how to do the braids. She no. wants the Anna and Elsa braids all the time. Oh, that you I'm do know how to do that. Oh, that's, that's I have pretty to. Impressive. Oh, yeah. You need to do a YouTube on that. Everything is on Anna and Elsa. <laughs> so, so I'll give you a good, a good quote from a friend of mine who says, you can't have it all, but you can have it some. Yeah, you know, like the way I interpret that actually is that everybody's life, every day of everybody's life is a series of choices. So we all right. have to make choices every single day. And it's actually a fun, wonderful time when the kids are little mm -hmm. and to make the choices that allow you to, to be with them. They'll be gone soon enough. Right. And then you'll have a whole other set of problems, I promise you. But <laughs> I'll tell you what, any, any, any time my husband and I have a rough day, you know, yeah. parenting, we, we look at each other. They tell us we'll miss yeah. the yes, yeah, someday. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, Josh, is there other language for men that might make it easier for them to think about or to talk about more openly the the work life issues? Not, yeah. not to make light of it, because yeah. I mean, it's a serious thing. Sure. I mean, so not everything needs fancy nomenclature. I mean, just you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it really is just like, what are you struggling with? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. um, and they, even if they're not processing it as work life balance, they know that they feel incredibly stressed. The term that I use very often um, is stretched out. How stretched out do you feel? And that gets us really far. Mm -hmm. I asked for my book, I asked guys, how stretched out do you feel on a scale from one to 10? And almost every guy said 10. And there were a couple that said eight. And this has real life ramifications. I said, okay, so what are you doing about it? Uh, some of them have, have started drinking, not addictively, but often because they don't know how else to calm down after like 16, 17, 18 hours straight of working at work, working at home. Some are getting addicted to video games and we need physical escapes. This is why I actually like the word balance, even without work life attached, work life attached to it, because I like to ask myself, am I feeling balanced? And for me, I've learned that if I am eating healthy, getting enough sleep, even just close to enough sleep and exercising at least a couple times a week, then I'm feeling balanced. 
And that to me makes me feel like I'm still in control of my life rather than being dragged along. Um, so I like to watch out for balance. But yeah, I have found that if you want a really good term that helps everyone understand what they're going through, stretched out goes pretty far. Mm, right. So um, if it, I, I want to go back to a question that I, I've been really wanting to ask a partner, a female partner in the <laughs> law firm for right. a long time. Um, I have had the wonderful privilege of speaking to many women lawyers groups, and I've only had one really horrible experience, and it was uh -oh. really horrible. And I'm going to tell you what I noticed, and I'm just, I want to get your thoughts sure. about whether this is an endemic thing or whether it was just a, 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 an unusual situation right. of a culture in a particular firm, Okay, which will be nameless. But, but, <laughs> but I, I was invited to speak to their women's initiative, and it was maybe three minutes in that I realized the woman who ran the women's initiative was, was perfect in every way. And there were a whole bunch of young lawyers sitting around the table who so clearly didn't want to be there, so clearly didn't want her life. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we talked about today was how do you keep women in the game when the game looks to them like not such a good game? Yeah. Like, I don't want that life. So... I'm very curious as to whether you have any observations along that line or advice for what you would do in a situation like that to, to help actually all of the women in that room, right, the perfect right. and the ones who looked like they didn't want to be there. That's a, that's a <laughs> tough question. And I can tell you, I graduated from law school in 2004 and we had probably, I want to say close to 50% male and female females in my graduating mm -hmm. class and of the women that I graduated with there's maybe two or three that are still practicing Ooh. it it is it is rough mm -hmm. and and it's because you know the billable hour requirements mm -hmm. do not do not accommodate right. somebody who wants to be home with their children sure. because it's you're also required to do professional development and that doesn't that's not a billable hour mm -hmm. so you're you're required to do so much work to just maintain your position right um and a lot of larger firms are really addressing that and it's great and i i know a lot of lawyers that have switched over to be of counsel at a firm which means you're no longer on the partner track but you're still getting to handle interesting cases i mean the, the problem with that of course is you're not on the track yeah, is that women never get to right uh, to, right yeah to the exact i mean so. and i can tell you what i did was you know went to a smaller firm and um, one of the partners at my firm, and they've all been together for 30 years, is, is Rachel Rosen, and she has three children. And she raised them all up through that firm, and the majority of the women that work there be, be the female lawyers and our staff are female. And it just, it creates an entirely different environment than from what I've seen from larger firms. And so for me, the answer would be, if you still want to be an a lawyer, either a transactional or whatever type of lawyer you are, um, you know, I happen to do litigation, um, find a firm that fits you, you know, I mean, good advice. Yeah. Any, yeah. For any, for any profession. And, and I can tell you in my first interview with my firm that I'm at now, and I've been there for five years and hope to be there for the, for the long haul. Um, because in my first interview, I said, look, I'm a, I am a really good lawyer, but I'm not a lawyer that's going to be here till eight o'clock at night. You, is that what you said? Exactly. Absolutely. Wow, I good said, for I, you. I will write that down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I got a call two days later and, and because I, I also said, respect the straightforward. Yeah. I think I, that's right. I think just in general, when people are willing to say what their boundaries mm -hmm. are. Right. Now if you're like a, an entry yeah, level lawyer time. with no experience right. and you know, yeah. no clap to back right. up what you're saying, then you know, maybe don't do that. Yeah, but, well you can't claim you're a really good lawyer if you haven't been a lawyer. Well yeah, yet. yeah. I mean I wouldn't yeah. go in there, you know, yeah. to when you're in your first few years of being a lawyer, you're gonna work crazy right. hours and you're and that's just part of the game. You're gonna get a ton of experience and, and that's you know, you're paying your dues. But once you get to a certain point and you do want to have more work to life balance, whatever that is, then yeah, find a firm that's a little bit slower pace. It's going to have lower billable hours. It's going to accommodate you and your needs as. But if I can add the other yeah, half I just of wanted yeah. to ask you to, yeah. to jump onto that and talk about um, the male version yeah. of, of just setting those boundaries. Exactly. Like I spoke at the American Bar Association. I speak to law, law, you know, lawyer, law students all the time. And I'll tell you, every time, it happened recently at the um, 
Florida Association for Women Lawyers. I spoke at this event, and, and afterwards, a couple of the guys there came up to me. They all tell me the same story, that um, when they were having their kid, <laughs> their boss said, said to them, well, yeah, we have whatever it was, five weeks paternity leave, but you're not taking it. Like, they just say it straight out. You're not taking, you're not taking, it. taking it. Right. And so think about what this means for the financial reality. It's so hard for women because they can't, don't want to work these crazy hours. I mean, no one wants to. And these men are told, if you take any time off at all, you will be off partner track. We're not going to respect you anymore. Mm -hmm. Families need money. So instantly in that moment, we diverge into this ancient madman way of living in which women go toward not practicing anymore and men go on partner track because they got to make the money and it's not what what they want and it's not what's best for business because they're losing brilliant think of all the brilliant women you went to law school with mm -hmm. who aren't even practicing now and the chances are statistically that you know they're as every bit as good as the guys yeah and, I, and the, the problem with with law i I've, I've not ever stepped out of the game, but the problem with law, I would imagine, is very similar to tech, is that if you're not there practicing every day and keeping right. up with the yeah. laws, you're yeah. that much further behind. Right. And, and, and yeah. so you kind of, you know, you need to stay in the game. Right. Um, and it's hard to get back on a track once yeah. you've ever gotten off of it, which is another thing we could talk about for another <laughs> hour or so, uh, <laughs> another systemic problem that truly, you know, mm -hmm. I think our culture has. Is it, it is very difficult to step off of a track mm -hmm. and then step back onto it. But I'm afraid we are starting to come to the end of our time. And we have a couple of things that we always do at the end of that time. The most important one is to ask each of you to share one tip or, or technique or tool that you can offer to the people who have tuned in that might help them in their own lives. So who wants to go first? As you wish. Go ahead. As you wish. Um, a tip that will help the viewers um i think probably having having your tribe having your village um find women or men that are like-minded that are going through the same thought processes that you are so that, what's the first step toward doing that <clears throat> how do you do that i mean i went to i believe i found executive mom society through linkedin but even before that I, you know, I have a large group of girlfriends, some that I'm closer with than I'm not. Um, but, you know, find the ones that are working mm -hmm. full time and, and, you know, go to, go to happy hour with them or, or, you know, talk to them about, you know, struggles or things like that. And, and that can kind of grow, but, but um, there's all sorts of groups all over the place that, that you can find that you can go and talk. And I know that that's nerve wracking for people to do, to just pop into a room where they don't know anybody, but, but, but absolutely you know, find, try find to go it alone. alone. Trying to go it alone right. is a kind of a losing strategy. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I can right. tell you yeah. right now in the happy hour just around the corner, there's about 10 members of my tribe that are here just to support me uh, from Executive Mom Society that, that came tonight just because they wanted to be here and support me. And um, so, and, and that's just the type of relationships that you're going to build if you find like-minded people that you can relate to right. and that you can rely on. Um, to kind of navigate this, yeah. so, I, I have another little oh, another okay, little good. for men. For men, we can give, and I think you'll I think you'll like this. <laughs> for men, if you have children, treat their mother well, <laughs> and pitch in fifty percent mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. If you see your wife juggling it, e you know, even if she isn't working full time. When you get home, mm. help out with the dishes, with the <laughs> laundry, because you know why. You know that guys, you're going to teach your son how to be a good man. And you're going to teach your daughter what to expect out of me. And so you're, you're going you're gonna to raise a little girl that's not going to be thinking that to be a perfect wife and to be a perfect mother, she's got to do it all. Sure. So um, the good news is, is that it's actually happening a lot more than anyone realizes mm -hmm. because of the stereotype. Mm -hmm. So overall, when you combine paid work, unpaid work, and childcare, men and women are putting in equal hours. The difference is that because men are stuck in the office for so many extra hours due to the hour stigma, the moms mm -hmm. end up doing so much more at home. So what we need to do is stand up to that. And I, you know, my, it's interesting because my advice is so similar to yours. It's, first of all, you have to know for a fact that you are not alone. So many people are struggling with this and they feel very alone, men and women, I hear it all the time. So you have to know as a fact that you're not alone. But then what we have to do, and I talked about this in the keynote today, we have to look at all these stigmas as a bully. 
and we have to stand up to the bully or else the bully keeps winning. So what we have to do is be totally unafraid from here on out to say, basically what you said, to say, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I plan to achieve. And here's what I'm struggling with. And whether you are a man or a woman, to talk about it, to own it, to share it with your colleagues, to share it with your friends. The more you do that, the more people will start to say, whoa, me too. And you build those alliances and suddenly you find that you have the strength to take on whatever it is you need to take on. I always tell people not everyone is going to take time Warner to court or have something, you know, maybe as dramatic as what I had, but everyone can take some kind of step. And once you have that confidence, you'll find your step. It might be that you meet with HR and you say, hey, this has got to this has got to tweak a little bit. What can we do to build it together? Mm-hmm. Or it might be that you meet with your friends and you say, you know what? Let's talk about how we can like push our local representative to create some better policies. You're gonna know what your step is, but you won't even begin to take it until you know that you're not alone. Wow. So, Josh, how can people find you? Oh, um, my website is joshlevs.com. I'm the only Josh Lebs in the world, so you find me. <laughs> and uh, go to LinkedIn right now and look me up, Josh Lebs. Ellie, you know how to spell it because you can see Josh Lebs. <laughs> and um, I'll accept you. I link in with everybody. It's the best. <laughs> I love that. Link in with everybody. everybody. Okay, very good. I'm, I, I do the same thing. Awesome. Oh, so this is good. But I, you know, I never understand these people who say, well, I just really, you know, I consider everybody. No. no. You know, mm-hmm. you never know. You yeah. never know. Sort of, sort of. That's right. Yeah, it's wonderful. Know. So, Marianne, how can people find the executive moms if they're in the Houston area? And what would you like to say about how they can find Pink Petro? Well, uh, Pink Petro is easy to find. It's pinkpetro.com. Um, and you can go to their website. They have an amazing online community for women in the energy industry to cl- corroborate and talk and plan things. And, and so then they go to that website. There's also experience.energy, which is the new job site that just launched yes. today through That's Pink exciting. Petro. Yes. It's all about um, finding jobs for women in energy. And they've got job postings and recruiters and companies that are, you know, exclusively posting their jobs there. It's a, it's a great way for women to connect and, you know, find some jobs. Um, for Executive Mom Society, our website is www.executivemomssociety.org. I slowed that down. You got the two S's in there. Two S's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can go there, and there's all sorts of information about Executive Mom Society. For women that aren't in Houston, send an email to us at executivemomsociety at gmail.com if you're interested in starting your own group, and we'll be glad to walk you through it or help you or whatever we can do. Um, so you can find us either of those places. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. My name is pretty hard to spell. <laughs> M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E. My last name is R-O-B-A-K. So I'm literally the only one with Oh yeah. That. So, yeah. <laughs> you you know there. That's, that's fantastic. Well, if we're not already LinkedIn, we will be LinkedIn uh, the minutes <laughs> after this is over with. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight with these amazing people. And it's been a wonderful experience for me today to be at Pink Petro's Her World in the second annual that's right second Second annual Mm -hmm. her world and uh, it's just been fabulous if there's any women who is involved in the energy industry really needs to come to this website remember that you can find anything you want to know about take the lead our training mentoring role modeling and thought leadership by going to take the lead women.com on twitter we are at take lead women and on all other social media we are take the lead women And we really appreciate your being here and look forward to seeing you next month, second Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. But we know it's always happy hour somewhere. (laughs) So you are welcome to join us and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much. And thank you guys. You were fantastic. Thank you so much. Gloria, can you announce the winner? Oh, the winner. Rhea, thank you so much. Yes, I, you know, I was, I kept, pulling it up on my phone so that I would not forget and then I forgot. So my apologies because the winner is from a city that we've never had a winner from before, okay? The winner this this week, uh, this month of our um, complimentary consultation coaching chat hour with me is Lori Lavin from St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri. So Lori, I will look forward to talking with you. And with that, thank you all again. And we'll sign off. Can I applaud now? <laughs>